Our guest today is Lydia, who is a research data scientist at the Alan Turing Institute. Hello, Lydia. Hello. Joe, I'm a bit scared. So am I. Is the robots going to take over and kill us? <laughs> oh, is that what you're scared about? Yeah. I was just scared about someone who's like definitely way more intelligent <laughs> than both of us. Are you a robot, Lydia? Uh, well, how would you know? I mean, oh my god, <laughs> what a start! Artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Lydia, what yeah. is artificial intelligence? Well, it's such a difficult question because what is intelligence? That's also a really difficult question. Subjective, is it? Yeah, it okay. is. I mean, I so I trained as a biologist and we think about this all the time. Like, what is intelligence? How do you know if an animal is intelligent or not? Uh, or a plant even? I mean, plants can find the light. Is that intelligent? Um, so <laughs> it's well, one it of is, these... isn't it? Pretty. Yeah. Pretty. Much. I don't know where I've started speaking in single words. <laughs> pretty much. You mean pretty intelligent, not pretty the... Aesthetically? Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah, so it's one of these questions, how do we define intelligence? So it's something you can tell when you see it, but not always be able to kind of define it properly. So uh, artificial intelligence tends to get defined as anything a computer can do that seems intelligent or is intelligent. So that's anything from being able to uh, print out some words for you on a screen or all the way to some of the more difficult, advanced uh, AI that we see at the moment. I don't think I've ever thought about it, but... A printer is really clever. It is. Because it's, it's writing things down you. just go... And then it goes... And then that... And it goes... That's a, that is a form yeah. of robot, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's producing something uh, for you that is a lot faster than you having to do it. So that's a form of technology. But it's intelligent, isn't it? Because it can talk to the computer and find out what you want to write down, and then it does it for you. So the kind of the line between what is artificial intelligence and what is not can get a bit blurry. I've got a lot of questions here, Joe. Right, yeah, but I think we should start at the start. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Which is... Mm-hmm. How did you get into AI? How did I get into it? Yeah, how did you get into it? You so, said you studied biology. Yeah. I was like, well, but then what made you go, fuck this, I'm going robots. <laughs> so I started off in zoology um, and I worked with bees for a long time. And I was working with this question of, of intelligence and learning in bees. So we used to teach the bees to, to perform tasks and then work out how good they are at it and how they learn over time. What sort of tasks? Uh, telling the difference between two different flowers, so fake flowers. So we could tell, get them to tell the difference between different coloured flowers, for example, or flowers that have got different shapes on them, or shiny and not shiny, that kind of thing. And they're really good at the task. I mean, they're absolutely brilliant. They're learning machines, bees. Aren't they? Yeah. They do a funny dance as well. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they teach each other where flowers are. Where what do you mean, funny them. dance? It's called the waggle dance. Do you want to give me a little example, Tom, of what <laughs> since you've come out with that? <laughs> right, Lily, I'm about to embarrass myself here, but I believe, Joe probably incorrectly, that they tap certain limbs to signal to the other bees where the pollen might be. So what the bees bullshit do? or true? <laughs> please, please, <laughs> pretty much, don't pretty let... Much. <gasps> pretty much. So they, they go home to their mates, and uh, they're all girls, and they, they go on the wall. Hang on, all bees are girls? Well, the bees you see out and about, they tend to be girls. Because all the ones doing the hard work, they're all girls. Makes sense. Well played. <laughs> where, are the, where are the males in They're all, all sitting then? in the hive, just eating and doing nothing. Lazy fuckers. <laughs> <Just> hypocrites. <laughs> <laughs> and they're a lot smaller as well. And if they ever escape, the girls bring them back again. They said, you're not going anywhere. Oh. Um, so, But yeah, once a year they'll go out and mate, but then they die afterwards. So male bees don't have a good life. Well, so you, it's quite a good life. So you were teaching these bees yep, teaching how them. to go to different flowers so they they learn the difference so we give them rewards and then there's water in the other one and then they learn the difference and you see how good they get over time so you're watching them learn and that got me interested in how computers do this right um and i started working with uh, more technology to do with biology so i ended up working with lasers uh looking at insects um right hang on lasers looking Mm -hmm. at insects yep I need more. <laughs> lasers mm-hmm. looking at insects. So a laser can be used for different things. One of the things it can be used for is looking for vibrations, so things that move up and down really, really fast on like a nanoscale. So the light that bounces back can tell you how much something's vibrating. And lots of the way things on insects work, work by vibration. So you can use lasers to look at them and, and tell how something's uh, working, basically. So I was looking at ears on insects using lasers. <laughs> 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 I didn't even know insects had it. No, yeah, they've got amazing ears. Literally just picturing a <laughs> little Pitch- set of ears on a bee. The bee just going... <laughs> <laughs> you're like, 
Why immediately have I, why have I got this picture of a bee and his ears are fucking Gary Lineker's? <laughs> like, just, they obviously don't have ears like ours, do they? I mean, they have them uh, sort of vibration sensors. So they have them on their antennae, for example. So some, some insects have them on their bodies, some have them on their heads. So there is ears all over the place in the insect world. So um, they're quite fun to look at. Um, the cricket have them on their legs or something? Yeah, crickets have got them on the side of their body oh. and then they make noises with their legs. Um, so, yeah. So I, I ended up in physics for quite a while. Um, Exactly. Is that your cricket? How did you do a cricket? <laughs> oh, that's oh, no, 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 no. Oh, fuck. What was I thinking of? Dolphin. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up, yeah, in physics for quite a bit, looking at animals and technology and using more technology to, to ask biology questions. And for that, you need kind of computer code, looking at how programming works and similar. And that's, this is becoming really, really important for science research. So more and more people, are, even in the jungle, are starting to use really advanced methods. Joe, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I, me and technology, I fear it sometimes because I don't know what it's doing. Mm. Other times, Lydia, I think it's going to make me redundant. Mm. And there's something my laptop has started doing recently where it is giving, as I'm typing away, I'm writing something, it is giving me an option for the next word before yeah. I've typed it. And initially I was like, yeah, whatever computer. It's fucking good though. Yeah, the number is. of times. So now, Joe, this is freaking me out because I'm thinking, this computer is better than me at what I'm doing. So hang on, your computer, is that what's happening on my phone? Your phone will do it as well, yeah. So when I'm texting, it will give me like a selection of three words yep. that they think it's going to be so that I can just click on that one. So that's AI. There's so, there's an AI in my phone. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Right. Uh, go with Tom's. <laughs> it's pro- sort Are of we going to get replaced thing. by AI? Is that what you mean? I thought there'd be lots of things that would be replaced. Mm. Like all the mechanical things. Mm. So obviously dishwasher being a classic example. I find it slightly chastening that creative writing could mm-hmm. be done better by a robot slash AI than my brain. Yeah, so there's there's two really cool um, AIs that have come out really recently. One's called GPT-3, and that um, can write really well. So you can give it a prompt, say, tell me a story about bears, and it will write a full story for you. What? Um, and it's quite creepy. Like You can look these up. They're, they're really good now. And, and what they've done is they've fed this machine all of the human written text that they can think of. Stop and, feeding it. And f- fed all of it. And it's learned how, do, how does language work? How do stories work? And then it can, it can generate new ones for you. Um, and, and there's another one that's called DALL-E, D-A-L-L-E. Uh, and that creates images for you. So you can say, I want to see a tiger sipping martinis. And it will create images <laughs> for you that's amazing. That's so you better. think, is this creativity? <laughs> Is this is this the machine creating things for us? Is this art? Um, are these are these stories it's writing now? So that oh, right. <laughs> so it's G D G T P three G P T three yeah. G brilliant. Fucking got that wrong straight away. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard to remember. So that one yeah. you've just said that would be what's going on in the phones and the. Uh, no, no, the, much more. Laptop. So a much more simple one is using on your laptop. So that one's learning from you. So yeah. as you type oh, okay. on your phone, so it is based on what his previous results yeah, exactly. and stuff have been. So if you're using Gmail for for example or another email service, they're kind of following what everyone's writing in their emails, and so they can start to learn. Oh, people tend to write thanks for your last email. It sounded great, and they can they can start to suggest that as oh, you're probably likely to start writing this kind of sentence. GPT-3 is a, like a huge version of that where they've fed it all of human text that they can get their hands on. So it's a much bigger version. It's not been rolled out completely yet because it's still quite massive. And they are a little bit worried about the implications of what it could do because journalists could use it to write articles and similar that's not been fact-checked, but it looks really real. So they're a bit worried oh. about it going rogue. What do you mean, Gmail? <laughs> what do you mean Gmail see everyone's yeah so they learn from what you're writing in your Gmail for example um, so that's part of the privacy is that legal I mean you sign away your rights when you when? were <laughs> when, when you sign you up to that? the service when there's terms and conditions and they, they say things like we we want to be able to read what you're what you're writing they a- anonymize it fuck so... I, hang on that was not put <laughs> <laughs> that was not put in bold no it wasn't ever. I mean this is why the EU gets upset with a lot of tech companies that are taking people's data because a lot of people don't realise that their data is being looked at and trained with. Um, and so there's there's big implications for privacy and, and similar. I'm going to start making a list, Joe, on my piece of paper of items of technology I'm going to smash when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am really nervous and scared now. So d- 
so there's there's definitely this idea now that, that data, so the kind of your u- your user interface, what you're using with a computer is now the new oil. So this is where all the money is coming from, how you use the world and, and technology. And that's where people are making money from it. So there's lots of questions about who owns it and do you have rights to it? And, and do you have the right to not be tracked and not be followed around on the internet? So that's, this is one of the big problems. Do, do we got. have the right? Do not at the have moment. The right to not be tracked? Not at the moment. What? The EU is looking into it and they're trying to put more regulations on Facebook and Facebook have got very upset about it, for example. So, so. the only way you can not be tracked is to not be on it? Unfortunately, that doesn't really work either. Um. Oh, <laughs> fucking hell. We're screwed. This is Especially what you in your fucking history on your... All right. Laptop. So do you remember? Do you remember? <laughs> do you remember if you sign up to a website and it says, "Would you like to sign in using Facebook or Gmail or Google?" Yeah. That's one of the ways they can follow you, even if you're not on Facebook. So they can follow oh. you around the web, for example. Um, and if you don't sign up to those services at all, they can kind of infer that you exist. So your friends, for example, if they're communicating with each other and they see an unknown number that's coming in, so maybe you're not on Facebook, but someone's communicating with you externally, they can kind of tell, "Oh, there's a Joe-shaped person in the so- social circle. We kind of know oh, you poor exist." <laughs> So that's that's why this is one of the big concerns about how big companies are using data and, and following people around the internet. And, and this does have implications for even things like democracy. So a lot of targeted ads that are used by politicians and similar, some of those can get quite scary about, about what data is being used for those purposes. So where I work, we're like looking into the ethics of all of data science and, and AI and how privacy is, is really important. So that this is something the people I work with. But very why weren't those ethics looked at before... It was all rolled out as to be like, yeah, just give us all your data. Uh, I guess that's how the world works, right? It makes you money. So Shoot first, ask yeah, later. Yeah, definitely. Fucking hell. Also, a lot of AI and technology is um, created by either people who want to make money with it, so through advertising. So Google and Facebook and uh, all the other big tech companies, they primarily make money from adverts. So they're looking at trying to increase you you know you using the service so a lot of their motivations about getting you to click more and, and and engage with their with what they're doing and then the people who are also creating new ai and algorithms they're researchers themselves so these are people working in universities and they might be a bit more disconnected from how it gets used in the real world so they might create something and not think about how this might end up being used in the real world so that's another reason why having places like the alan turing institute which looks into the ethics of, of who's creating ai and what could the problems be that that come out from it so so that's something that we work on a lot as well i'm going to say mm. some everyday items yeah and i need to know whether they are ai mm-hmm. or not Toaster. Um, depends on the toaster. Okay, I've got a Breville uh, <laughs> hopper. So one that you put a little timer on. Yeah, that does the time for you, and then pops it up when it's done. So yeah. that's a kind of intelligence, isn't it? It knows when when it's done based okay. on the time. So that's a tick for me. Microwave. Uh, yeah. Again, you can set it, and it goes. But it's not feeding any information in, so it's not looking at your food and going, "Yeah, I reckon." So that's it can't done. get. It can't get more intelligent no. it is what it is it is what it is but it's and not. that's that's what most of our ai is like it's got a singular purpose it does the thing it's supposed to do and that's that that's basically how all ai works at the moment quad bike uh i don't think so. well again it's a machine right so yeah. the the blurry line between what's intelligent or not i mean you give it a control and then it, it acts on that on the engine so to it to an extent well it's it's not working at the minute because <laughs> <laughs> i've flooded it with petrol so the engine's a bit fucked so but there's for example there's rice cookers that can kind of take in information about the steam levels and then change the the amount of heat that's going in so it's a feedback system so that's that's like an intelligent rice cooker they're quite cheap nowadays <sighs> fucking hell <laughs> okay yeah alexa <gasps> yeah that's a form of ai so the the first three toaster microwave quad bike added with the rice maker mm. i haven't got but i'm interested in getting one now <laughs> it might be really really good mate so hard cooking rice it is hard so cooking rice. Fucking that's hell. why you need a robot to help so hard but they seem like normal kind of your technology in, in, the way we've been in using semi-control computers. of them exactly yeah they're, exactly. they're not going to jump out and be like ah <laughs> what's the what's the pro, uh will smith uh i am legend yeah. so that so no no fuck i robot i, I robot i robot, I robot the terminator these are all examples of generalized artificial intelligence so these are uh, machines that theoretically exist that can learn about the world around them and understand it so they are machines that think so alan turing he invented the turing test which is he had an idea that one day machines could think for themselves and so people were trying to work 
in generalized AI to try and produce a machine that can generally understand and, and act more like a person. But at the moment, we're really far away from all of that. So even though Alexa or Siri can talk to you, they don't understand what, what, what anything is. So they can talk to you and sound very uh, impressive, but there's no understanding. There's no thinking there. Let's talk about Alexa because, mm -hmm. um, and I'm conscious that I'm coming across as a massive Luddite here, Lydia. <laughs> uh, Murph, my partner, wanted to get an Alexa. Mm -hmm. And I said we shouldn't get an Alexa because everything that we said, Alexa would basically be listening to, even if Alexa wasn't listening to all our conversations. The fact that we'd be telling Alexa certain tunes to put on and stuff like mm -hmm. that would be used to sell us stuff we didn't want mm -hmm. in a planet that was already dying of overconsumption. And she got quite pissed off at me. Joe, you look surprised. <laughs> was there any validity in anything I said to her, Lydia? So, I mean, people are very nervous about these these kind of technology listening to us. And to an extent, we have to just trust the big companies that they're not when they say that they're not. But it depends on how paranoid you're feeling. Uh, one of the, I suppose... The ideas about how these these voice activated uh, technology work is that they're listening out for you to, to use the keyword, so Alexa or Siri or similar, and then they turn on. But that does mean they have to listen all the time. So they are oh. technically listening, but are they are they collecting info or not? So at the moment, the big the big tech companies say they're not, but they are always listening. Or you know, so I I I did I did something similar, Tom. But I actually bought one, <laughs> <laughs> so I had the conversation. And went, nah, fuck, fuck it. it, you know. But when you, it seems like an easy route to do. It's quite handy to have. Put some music on. What's the weather? Tell me. Oh, let's do that. Did it for about a week. Then I sort of saw some of these stories around it. Started getting freaked out. <laughs> fucked it off in the cupboard. <laughs> it stayed there ever since. Unplugged. Still listening. Up Even life. Uh, no, as in unplugged, without the plug in it. Fuck, that's exactly what no I mean. Power. Not just unplugged from the wall, <laughs> like unplugged. So I was like, it's properly dead in the cupboard. But even now, I'm like, I need to go back home right now. What if now. it's got a big internal battery and it's just still listening? Yeah, because it was the big long one. It wasn't the little one either. I need to fuck that off in the bin, don't I? So Alexa and Siri and all the other voice activated ones, they're getting smarter over time because they're learning from the way they get used in the home. So when you give it a command, that does help it get smarter over time. So, um, all of this data from everybody's homes and everybody using it is helping the the, the ultimate servers get better and, and the algorithms involved. So, yeah, how, do, it is. how does it work? How does how does Siri on mm -hmm. your phone or voice recognition actually work? So it's always listening. Mm -hmm. So that's the first one. It's it's always it's a microphone, and when it registers the keyword, then it starts recording, and then it transforms that into text. So your voice becomes readable text and then that text is used to uh, figure out what, what you're what you're talking about so it might be that you're asking for example to play a certain song so it'll use uh, voice recognition to, to figure out what song you mean and then play it to you so it's transforming your voice into text and then using that to uh, to follow your command as it were right I, d I don't use it <laughs> well some people are freaked out by it I, I don't use it a because I'm freaked out by it but b because I'm still not really sure how to use it go on in. Uh, you could say Siri, Siri, what's the weather? Siri, can you play me Paul Simon? You can call me Al. <gasps> I've won. Siri's not working. <laughs> Have you, you disabled it on your phone? Can you do that? <laughs> yeah, you can turn it off. Yeah. Hang on. Hey, Siri, can you play Paul Simon, please? On Spotify? I'll need to access your Spotify data to do this. There you Is go. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, here's... Oh! <laughs> oh, fucking hell, Siri, I love you. <laughs> Voice recognition has been a huge issue for computers to try and solve. It's taken a long, long time and lots of research because you imagine lots of different backgrounds, lots of different voices, accents, uh, tone of voice. It's a really difficult problem to solve. And uh, the way it works is through deep learning, which is one of the, the main big advances in AI that's happened in the last Hang few on, years. Hang on, I don't like that word. Deep. Deep fake yep, comes deep fake. to mind. Exactly. So deep learning. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> it's like saying, is a tool a good thing or a bad thing? If you're used for 
good or evil, for sure. Just depends who's using it. Exactly. Oh, okay. So AI started out, say, um, do you remember when AI first um, beat the chess master? Yeah. Um, so that was something called symbolic AI. So what they did was they taught the computer all of the different possible moves that chess uh, can do, so all the rules. And then when it was playing against the chess master, the computer really, really quickly was figuring out all the possible moves that could come next in a second. So it was working out a million different possibilities and then figuring out what was the best way uh, to go forwards. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the computer knows the rules of the game. But to do that kind of task, chess is really useful because the rules are really strict and you know exactly what's what. But when more general problems come out, like voice recognition or uh, how do humans speak to their phone, the rules are really fuzzy. You don't know all the possibilities that could happen. And so that kind of AI doesn't really work for, for these kinds of problems. So a new AI came along, a different type, which is called deep learning. And that's kind of been a game changer and it's changed uh, a lot of our technology a lot already. And that works in a different way. Um, and do you want me to explain how it works? I would fucking love you to explain it. <laughs> Clearly this, fa this face <laughs> that I'm pulling has no idea. <laughs> um, so uh, you start with... Um, you give, you give the computer examples of correct things. So, for example, have you ever tried to do a capture and it says, can you find all the traffic lights in the picture? Yeah, saying I'm yep. not a robot. Exactly. So in that, you, would, you as a human are saying, oh, here are the traffic lights. Click, 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 click. Now, what you're producing there is a data set of telling the computer what traffic lights look like in, from different angles and different shots and similar. So you're actually creating a really useful data set. Um, and that's used to train computers. So I've been tricked on that as well. Yeah. Fucking hell, Lydia! <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so uh, you produce a big data set that shows you what traffic lights are. So you feed that to the computer and say, hi, computer, here are all the things that are traffic lights and here are all the things that aren't traffic lights. Can you tell the difference? And what happens is um, you have what's called a neural net in the inside of the computer. So it's called a neural net because it works a little bit like how our brain works in a way. So brain cells are connected to brain cells are connected to brain cells in a big web. And it's similar in this machine. So uh, there's lots of different um, nodes that are connected together. And what happens is they try and get better over time at being able to tell what's a traffic light from what's not a traffic light. Um, and so they tweak their, their sort of their metrics, they're trying to figure out what the rules are. And then eventually they get really, really good at it and incredibly good. However, we often don't know what it's learning in and what's going on under the surface. So we often aren't quite sure what it might be figuring out. It's That's why some people get a bit nervous because um, AI can be a little bit of a black box where we don't know what the rules are that it's learning. So d does any of that make sense, um, this idea? It, wor it, it makes sense, but it's really worrying. And in the same breath that you mentioned about these brain cells yeah. that we've got that mm -hmm. connect, and you go, well, that's the same in the computer. And you go, <laughs> what do you mean that's the same in the computer? <laughs> how, have, how have you created that? It's but, just math. Yeah, but f that's phenomenal. It, it's pretty crazy. And it's changed the world already so so much. And it's really helpful as, as a piece of technology because it means we can look at data that's incredibly complicated and that's really helpful for research, for solving problems in healthcare, problems that human beings just can't do. But computers really can using these kinds of things. What sort of problem? Like an example, what sort of problem can a human not work out <laughs> that, AI that this can. AI mm -hmm. can. So um, we collect a lot of data now. So we produce more data in the last couple of years than the rest of human history. Um, so that's all the big. time. That's that's big. That's that face is oh, wow. immense amounts of data. And, and a lot of this is really relevant to healthcare or science. And um, so there might be, you know, doctors recording information about patients. Um, but being able to wade into that and find trends or, or information is really difficult. Imagine looking at the, the world's biggest spreadsheet. You just get lost. You couldn't, you couldn't understand it anymore. But we know that there's really important insights in a lot of this data. So it might be, for example, who might get dementia or who's got a cancer. And so if we use machines and set it loose on the giant, huge data sets that a human being can't look at with their eyeballs, it really narrows things down. We can really solve big problems that we couldn't do normally. So this is why it's so critical for science research um, and for applications in, in loads of different fields. So I know AI is scary, but it is changing the world of medicine and research and everything and that's how I, I got into AI um, from a science point of view. What Joe if we think the computers are doing that but they're actually stitching us up they're doing something else. So this does happen. <gasps> what? <laughs> I, li I honestly I was so intrigued about where this episode was going to go <laughs> but I'm not intrigued anymore. I don't, I don't want to know because, Lydia, you are fucking killing me. <laughs> Everything is fucked. 
Right, I'm going to need a second to just take this all in and turn off all my <laughs> devices, actually, and all the cameras. Can we get everything turned off? And <laughs> then after the, the ad, <laughs> after the ad break, we'll turn it all back on. I need a minute, so let's have some ads. <laughs> Joe, uh, we've got so many questions here. Do you know what I've been thinking of as Lydia's been talking about voice recognition? Have you seen that Alan Partridge thing where he's trying to speak to the um, book a cinema ticket down the phone line? Have you seen that? <laughs> where he's sitting there and just going, Inception. <laughs> no. Inception. No. Where <laughs> the, the computer cannot understand him saying Inception. I, I've, not, I've not seen it. But yeah, that is, that's, that's something that's been such a difficult problem. It's taken us decades to be able to solve voice recognition. It's, it's a really difficult challenge. Um, I mean, if you think about how my voice is working right now, you can't tell where the spaces are. You can't tell where the sentences end or stop. All of the noises I'm making, they're just merging together. Like, how, how would you do that as a machine? It's really difficult. So you're actually saying machines are thick as fuck? Yeah. Oh, so not as clever as that. So no, they're, they're, they're in the, up on their high horse. But they're not quite as clever as us yet. Oh, no, far from it. So I'll give you a really cool example. So you, you were saying before about how maybe they're kidding us and they're not actually that clever. And, yeah. and this does happen a lot. So there was a really nice example I saw where somebody tried to teach a computer what's the difference between dogs and wolves. So they would show them photographs of wolves and dogs, often huskies, so they look quite similar to wolves. Stitch up. And yeah, but the, the computer's the, not got eyes. <laughs> so the, the computer can, can look at the pixels on an image. Uh, <laughs> it's not got eyes. It hasn't got eyes. How's it, it can, looking at this picture? It can, it can understand the data. So a pixel has got information numbers that are encoded in it that tell you the colours, the darkness, the lightness. And that's what the computer's seeing. Oh, fucking hell. Yeah. So it sees, so you know the matrix with the binary code? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's how a computer sees things. Uh, oh, wow. Through, through, through that. Um, so someone taught it the difference between, say, huskies and wolves by showing it lots of images that have been labeled. So someone had said, this is a wolf, this is a husky. And then it tested it. So they gave it new images that the computer had never seen before and says, is it a dog? Is it a, hu is it a wolf? And the computer was really, really good. And then it started making quite stupid errors. And they were thinking, this is strange. This shouldn't be you know, making these kind of stupid mistakes. And so they, they went into it a little bit further and tried to figure out what does the computer actually learn about these photographs? What's it using to tell the difference between dogs and wolves? And the computer wasn't looking at the dog at all. It was looking at the background because if there's snow in the background, it tends to be a wolf. So it wasn't even looking at the right thing. And this is something that happens all the time. And so you have to be really careful about what your computer is actually learning. Because remember, it's really stupid. It doesn't know what the meaning of these things are. It's just data. It's not. It doesn't mean it knows what a dog is or. That's a wolf. what you think. <laughs> but how? Oh, it could be tricking. How us. do we know mm. that they're not double bluffing the shit out of us and going, <laughs> "Oh, I need to get these ones wrong now, just to not let on that I am." running their world yeah yeah i mean this is is that possible i mean so people do talk about this from a kind of philosophy point of view so if we do get generalized artificial intelligence which we're very far from at the moment um you know how you're a lot smarter than than a dog and you can easily well. trick a dog <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, <Joe. laughs> you can easily trick a dog right you can pretend to throw a ball and the dog will run after it um what if the computers end up being that much smarter than us and they could trick oh us? God. Um, so this is what people are nervous about and there's a lot of philosophy around it. But that being said, we're very far from that and that's not how our AI works at the moment at all. Joe, you'll be familiar with Terminator. The Terminator, Terminator. Yeah. Never seen it. Don't give me that. It's a really great film. You've never seen the Terminator? No. Terminator 1 and 2, brilliant I've, film. I used to play, uh, I think it was, ter what, what's the one where he... Uh, he melts or he's like metal. He can change into yeah. metal. That's Terminator 2. Ter so I used to play Terminator 2 on the Sega. I've never watched it. Great I've film. seen clips, but I've never watched it. So Lydia, you'll have to lead on this, please, Tom. Can you describe, Lydia, what Skynet is on Terminator and why it's so terrifying? Um, so I think Skynet is rogue AI, isn't it? So it's an AI that um, has learnt and can, can teach itself and it understands the world and it's decided it wants to get rid of humans for whatever reason. So it's decided to go to war against people. Um, so people talk about this kind of thing theoretically and what could happen if we produce something and what if it becomes um, beyond our control. Um, so like I said, it's more the realm of philosophy at the moment about what would we do in the future. So 
places like the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford, they they try and think about some of these God, problems. What do you work like working there, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> of humanity. I'm going to apply soon. <laughs> we should. They look at existential threats like this. So they, they consider super AI could be an existential threat to the human race. But it is all theoretical. So we'd have to see. Uh, but it could happen one day in, in many, many, many decades time. So you're saying there is, there is a possibility. Mm-hmm. I know it's all like hypothetical mm-hmm. and... But at some point in the future, robot I mean, at some point in the future, computers, AI, can get a tele- Fucking dickhead! I'm clearly going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> or they might leave me spit. Let's leave him around as some sort He's of... He's no threat. Yeah, fuck him. <laughs> so you're saying that at some point in the future... <laughs> <laughs> Bring on the robots... <laughs> Bring on the robot podcast hosts. <laughs> oh, I don't even want to finish the question. Now. <laughs> Will there be a robot uprising? <laughs> in the- <laughs> Lydia. Yes. Will there mm-hmm. at some point in mm-hmm. the... Fuck off! <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so at some point in the future... Fuck! Did you look away? You're... Pretty- <laughs> You're- Oh. I'll look away, sorry. <laughs> at some point. Right, at some mm-hmm. point in the future, will there possibly be a robot uprising like there is in I Am Robot mm-hmm. that we get to the point where general AI mm-hmm. decides I'm going to fucking take over the world here because I am far more intelligent than the human beings that are inhabiting <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically, yeah. I mean, um, does why... that not scare you? You say that so like just laissez faire. Is that what's the word? Yeah, yeah laissez faire. Was it? Yeah. Um, you say that so laissez fairly. Well, I think it could be a long, long time away. And, okay. and I work with computers and AI all the time, and it's honestly really stupid. It can't make very good jumps in conclusions. Uh, computers don't really understand the world, and this this happens all the time. I mean. The computers do what you say, not what you mean. And that's always a frustrating um, problem that you get when you work with, with AI. Um, so that's a no, not yet. No, no, we're really far off. Way far, anything way like off. that. Yeah, but it could happen. We'd be dead, Tom. Great. Don't worry. Some, 100 years? Some people think decades. Some people think hundreds of years, but we don't really know. I mean, <laughs> something that could teach itself and get exponentially um, more intelligent would happen very quickly. So that's why people are nervous. <gasps> so it could go from chicken intelligence to chimp intelligence, to human intelligence in 12 seconds, for example. 12 seconds? Theoretically, because of exponential growth and how that works. So this is something people write about and they worry about. And there are people who are AI ethicists that, that think about these kind of things. But it's it's very theoretical. Um, nothing like that exists so far. We're not there yet at all. Tom, do you hoover in your house? Yes. Do you? That's a lie. Murph will pull me up on Yes, you will. Murph does the hoovering. Okay, yeah, fine. She's bad, I know. Have you ever thought about getting one of those... Hoover robots. White. Did, did White. <laughs> <laughs> White it how they are. Have you ever thought about getting one of those robot hoovers? It's funny you should say this, Joe, because last week when we were on holiday as a family, the garden at the little cottage where we were renting had one of the self... The mowers. The mowers. And I've got to be honest, Lydia, I found it threatening. Threatening? Because it kept just moseying over and we were having a conversation. You're like, Who, what the f-? It's like not it was, moseying it's, over, it's cutting the grass for you. Yeah, but it just kept wandering over. I've said wand- it again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mosey, wander, it's cutting the grass for you. I found it menacing. Um, Lydia, I found mm. the way it moved around, because it moved, clearly it has to move at a relatively slow pace mm-hmm. to mow the lawn. But that added to its threatening nature. Mm, yeah. Also, the fact, weirdly, had it had eyes, I would have found that threatening. Even googly eyes? That would have been bad. But then the fact it had no eyes also freaked me out mm. because it was like a sightless listener. <laughs> um, I mean... Yeah, so trying to go from a computer in a box to the real world is something that's really bad at the moment. So we've got some quite cool examples of big warehouses that are got full, full of robots. Um, so I think, is it Ocado? They have almost a fully automated factory where they package everything up and it's all done on by little robots on wheels that move what? things around. It's really exciting. It's very, uh, very cool. It's all fully automated. Um, but the part where 
the object has to go in the bag is still done by humans. So the robots bring things to the people, the people use their hands to put objects in the bags, and then it goes to the next stage by robot. So the bottleneck in this is the human hand, where we can't recreate that at all yet. We can't we can't um, have action intelligence, so being able to deal with the real world and, and pick something up and not break it, that's really, really difficult for a robot. So at the moment, things like moving around in the real world, a Roomba going around your room, really difficult problems because it's it's involved with the real world and lots of unknowns and self-driving cars is a huge issue and trying to understand all the unknowns but that is is why there aren't really are there any self-driving cars now yeah that are legal to use yeah and there's several states where they're allowed to drive around so yeah. in america not over here um i mean they're also made here i don't know if they're allowed on public roads but in america they're allowed on general roads and have you do you know any data <laughs> just stop there do you know any data? <laughs> Do you know any data on whether it works or how many crashes there have been because of the driverless cars or what's going on there? Um, so I think... One of the one of the things they're trying to do is gather more data to try and teach the, the the cars to to be able to deal with lots of situations. So most of the time, self driving cars have a human being in there ready to take over when things go wrong. Um, I don't know the statistics, but I know there have been accidents and uh, quite a few. Um, and I think there's also been fatalities as well. So this technology is not great. Because Still the problem is, way off. Yeah, I mean, even if you solve ninety nine percent of problems, that one percent is incredibly deadly because you're working with a car that's got a lot of momentum, can really hurt somebody, and it's really dangerous so the self-driving car has to be absolutely perfect before it can properly work so yeah and there's a lot of fear about them as well and rightfully so because we don't like the idea of a machine hurting somebody and it's not it's not good so yeah i think we're still a way off with those but the teslas you can buy they have um autopilot mode where they try and use information to make decisions for you um, about how to brake and similar so it's becoming, I think we'll see more of that. So uh, things that help you break, things that maybe try and circumvent an accident because it's also taking in information maybe faster than you're able to react. So it would help you out in that sense. Just back on that uh, mm. Ocado warehouse yes. set up and how it's going to clearly be more efficient for mm. a machine to move around all these objects and, the, and then you need the human to actually put it out the yeah. bag and put it in the other bag. Yeah. But does that essentially make the human redundant, or or not quite fully redundant yet? But it's to a point, shit is job. Well, yeah, you just yeah. Got, well, you got to pick it out there, and then the the argument would be, well, I don't have to pay you as much now because you're doing half the job. Yeah. Although it's an important job, mm. you're moving that from that bag into that bag, and you go, well. How's that fair on humans? Yeah, I mean, automation um, is going to change the way that jobs work, I think. Um, and that has happened in human history a few times. So in the Industrial Revolution, 80% of people were farmers, and now 4% of people are farmers. Um, and so we've seen a huge change what? in human history. No, no, no. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> 80% of people well, were I don't farmers know the, or well, some, some something massive like that. Yeah, because and back it in, dropped to like 4%. Yeah, so in the Industrial Revolution, people moved from the countrysides to the cities because farming jobs were becoming uh, automated using steam machines and similar. You didn't need people hand harvesting. I mean, that's why we have summer holidays for, for kids, right? It's to help with the harvest because we needed that many labourers to be able to help um, actually get food. And now we don't need that because oh, we've got machines. Is that right? Mm -hmm. We needed summer holidays for the farmers. I didn't know that. I don't know why I'm nodding like. Is that, that why they're trying to you. cut down the summer holidays now? Aren't they trying to make it more like staggered? Because they're like, we've got less farmers, so you need. Le I mean, we don't need farmers as much, so you don't need as much time in the summer. Next time your kids, Joe, complain of being bored in the summer holidays, <laughs> tell them what they should wheat. be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we've already seen in human history this happen where tools or machines take our jobs. And so this could happen, and it already has happened. I think a lot of people's jobs are now automated and they've just got different types of jobs now. But yeah, I think we'll have to see what happens over the next decade and, and what kinds of jobs go away. But like you said, you know, you could see that the machine was writing for you. It might not be that creative or um, knowledge work is as safe as it was um, with automation in factories, for example. It could be that they we get replaced as knowledge workers as well. So that's the interesting part. Um, so at the moment, we've got uh, machines that try and find insights from scientific data. So could it be that scientists become more redundant, for example? Um, we've got some machines that are trying to do science. Um, so th we've got, um, there's DeepMind that tries to look at um, There's that word again. Deep, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Scaring me. Deep mind. Here we go. So deep mind is a, an offshoot of Google and they do research into AI and try to use AI to sort of 
uh, solve really, really difficult problems. So most of the problems they've been solving have been games, um, like the game Go, uh, which is a bit like the kind of Eastern version of chess. Um, and they've also been trying to solve biochemistry, like how do different proteins, which are really complicated molecules, how do they work? So they've been trying to solve these problems and they're getting really good. Um, some of them are really exciting. So, so is this machines doing research? Um, could the scientists be out of a job? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Surely you'll always need a human yeah. for for something. I think and also so. the you can't teach oh, maybe you can. You can't teach AI or a computer spontaneity or creativity or the, surely they're always going to be programmed from what someone's put into them. I mean, that's the how new do they part. develop their own fucking well, pathways the... to go? Well, this is completely spontaneous <laughs> and something that I've come up with on my own. So, so deep learning is the computer teaching itself. So that is quite spontaneous and it can be quite quite new. I mean, it's still taking data in from the outside world. So we have given it the sort of the setup, as it were. But the insights can be brand new, which is why it's really useful in science, for example, because you get to see connections that a human being didn't see before, and the machine can see it for you. So that is spontaneous and new, and and different, and that can be really helpful. So at the moment, for example. Or, um, in the Turing Institute, we're looking at um, sea ice in the Arctic and how that changes based on different weather patterns. And so that's loads and loads of data coming in all the time in real time. And yet we can now have really big insights from that because we're using AI to kind of figure it out for us. So you can get really cool insights that are brand new, uh, that have not been taught to the machine directly, um, that it can just do for you. Does a computer know it's a computer? No. Not yet. Could it? Potentially, but you'd need generalized AI for that. So that's where a computer can actually understand the world and understand what's what's there. I'll give you an example. So um, one of the Google lot, <coughs> they taught um, computers how to play Pong, you know, the game with the paddles. Atari. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it gets amazingly good. It can, you know, beat this game, get the top highest score ever by trial and error. So it learns over and over again how to get a really good score. If you then move that game a little bit, so shift all the pixels down, or maybe put it on a diagonal, or uh, maybe put it into 3D. If I got a child to do that, they'd understand, they'd be like, oh yeah, I know how to play this game because it's basically the same. There's still paddles, there's a ball. Computer won't understand. Even if you just moved it a, st a tiny bit, doesn't understand, does not understand the concept of what is happening. It just understands the world through ones and zeros and, and binary. So yeah, we don't have computers that have insight or conceptual thinking at the moment. So. A computer can't love. <laughs> Can a computer love? Why are you looking at me? Look at Lydia. She's the expert. I'm scared of Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not scary. She no, no, you're not. <laughs> Can a computer love? No. It can't. Not it doesn't yet. know how to love. No. We'd, we'd have to ask these questions when, when we get, you know, more generalised AI, when we, when we start seeing real, you know, intelligence. Could it fake love, though? Could it understand enough? to give you the indication that it loves you. What's, what's that That's film the with film, Joaquin it? That's what I was thinking of. Phoenix. It is, yeah. yeah. They give Good, responses like, oh. I... With uh, Scarlett Johansson as Classic. the voice of his yeah. hard drive. Also Ex Machina. That's another one that mm. explores his questions. Brilliant. Really I'm so glad you've cleared that up for me because I'm pretty sure I used to call it Ex Machina. Mm. <laughs> so did I. And it's Ex Machina. <laughs> it's a Greek term, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, that, these kind of questions are something that, that we've been thinking about for a long time. I mean, robots... Uh, even the Terminator films, they they kind of question this as well. Like, can a, a, a Terminator become fond of humans and understand and similar? So, yeah, it's all the realm of philosophy. Right now, we've got computers that are really helpful for telling us about data and numbers and, and giving us <coughs> insights about connections and things. But understanding human relationships, long, long, long way off, I think. I, I think we're very far from, Fucking from that. Fucking we're, hell, we're a long, long way off of understanding. <laughs> oh, <where's laughs> That's true. Jesus. When I go on my phone yes. and I'm scanning through Instagram yes, and then halfway through I get an advert for something that I was talking to my wife about, mm -hmm. say suitcases, mm -hmm. half hour ago, mm -hmm. my phone wasn't on. It mm -hmm. wasn't like unlocked or anything. It yep. was just there on the side. Is that because we've spoken about suitcases, it's heard me and then it's gone... Right, Joe's on his phone now, and at some point, I'm going to chuck a fucking suitcase advert at him. <laughs> so, theoretically, that could be the case. I think they'd get in trouble for doing that, so they probably don't work that way. I think what happens, which is honestly a bit more scary, is that they just know you really well. So, um, 
one of the ways that these big ad companies work is they try to cluster people together. So they say, okay, the way you use the computer is very similar to this bunch of people who also use the computer. And these these categories can be, you know, really, really, really minor, like fine tuned. It might be only 20 people that you're in the same cluster with. Um, and then it might be that the way that you were using a computer, so maybe you started looking up um, uh, maybe the rules of your work about about when you can take work, take leave. Or it might be that you, um, the way that you were using a computer started to suggest you might be thinking about going on holiday or something. And so as a result, they've learned from other people that are very similar to you or that have been doing things in a very similar way to you that they end up buying suitcases pretty soon after that. And so that's how it works. It feels really uncanny because you're like, I just had that conversation. But really, probably we're giving it more clues further further back in time, probably. Um, there's also confirmation bias. So there might be a loads of ads that you see all the time that are completely irrelevant. And then you see that and you go, oh yeah, I, I, I'm not even gonna remember that random ad I saw. But the one time you were talking about an ad and suddenly it's there, that's called confirmation bias. So um, does that make sense? Yeah, but and the way you've described it yeah. has then made me feel, I don't know about you, Tom, that I'm I'm scared of it. More scared. Or, or no, not more scared. The opposite now that I'm like, but actually, it's really handy. It is, and that's because why it's very. Popular. I do need a suitcase, so thanks for sending me some deals or send me in a direction to prompt me to go. Well, this is kind of what you've said you wanted, so why don't you go ahead and do it? Yeah, which is sneaky, but also like, well, yeah, I need. I, yeah. I actually really appreciate it. Give me a prompt to definitely to go and do it. And people really enjoy getting very personalised um, experiences with with their media, um, music tastes, and similar. So, so these technologies are useful and they're quite quite cool a lot of the time. But we always have to be careful and think about what are the repercussions of this. So, um, I think AI ethics is something really interesting and something I've been working on quite a bit. Um, and thinking about in terms of privacy and, and who owns your data and similar, because uh, one of the one of the problems we get is that if you put biased data into your algorithm, you're going to get a biased answer. So, for example, if you put in data that comes from the real world and the real world is sexist and racist, the machine will end up sexist and racist as what? well. And so we already see this happening. So, um, for oh, example. No. Uh, Google Translate got into trouble recently um, because people were typing from one language where there is no he or she at all in the language. They just use uh, completely neutral uh, pronouns. Um, so if you type in that language, uh, he shops or they shop, they cook, they clean, it translates it to she, even though there's no, um, in, the, in the original text, there's nothing about being a woman. But because, unfortunately, the text has learnt from very biased data, it then gives you an answer that's very biased. So it was things like, he leads, she cleans, um, and this kind of thing. Oh. So quite, quite problematic. And then people use these algorithms uh, in, in bad ways. So they might use it for job um, selections, so to sift through CVs, and these can end up really sexist and racist. And so you've got to be very careful about what what what's the biases that come out of these algorithms? I think we, we kind of imagine computers as being really objective, but it's only as objective as what's going into it, and and that can be you know tro troubling. What the fuck is the metaverse? <laughs> the only thing I can think of the metaverse being is like The Sims. You know, like that old game where you're just mm. controlling people in a house and you go, oh, that, that's it. But that's all I can picture is Mark Zuckerberg turning into a giant human sim. <laughs> is that the metaverse? What is it? Um, so metaverse, so I think now Facebook is now called Meta. I think that's been their rebrand. Um, and they want to produce a world that's virtual reality that you can go and shop in and interact with. It's just a, a new way of using the internet, I think. But I'm not sure it's you know, particularly interesting. Uh, oh. That's a relief to me. That I is mean, a, that's a massive relief to me as well. I thought that's the way the world's going. Let's all get on the metaverse. <laughs> Do you think about what it'll mean for your kids? Because that's my... This, again, is me being a Luddite, Lydia, but I've got mm. this doomsday scenario where at some point in the future I go downstairs and my kids are all wearing VR headsets and they're bobbing around in this world that doesn't actually exist in my head and they're buying things that only exist in that world, so they're buying trainers that they only wear in the VR world. Well, we're already in that. Oh, oh no! Right? I mean, people buy skins for their games, like in Fortnite and yeah. all so, sorts. Yeah, I'm so um, old, Joe. And then we also, we also interact in a place that doesn't exist, like our WhatsApp groups or um, messaging groups. That's a lot of people gathered in one place and they can all see what's going on, even though we're physically very far apart from each other. It's been really helpful in lockdown. So, yeah, being able to connect with people in a place that doesn't exist is something we've been doing for a, quite a while now. So, That's why yeah. the way you dress it up as a lad, uh, you're a Luddite and thing, but you break it down, it's 
actually really good. It's it's just dependent on how you use yeah, the AI. Definitely. It depends on how you're using the technology. So you go, there's that classic picture you can see where everyone on the tube is on their phone or thing. But then 50 years ago, everyone on the tube was just in a paper. Yeah. So it's the same, Yeah. but we're looking at it from... When, so we uh, tend to look from an old school view where you go, oh, get off the phone. But it's what, hang on a minute. Jasper on his Nintendo Switch, it's actually in learning a huge amount as an eight-year-old, going hand-eye coordination with, with his fingers and thumbs. He's learning about all the technology yeah. that's on there. We're much more He's developing now. in a different way. Yeah, exactly. I think the issue is if they're spending 12 hours a day on it and they're not getting a, a sort of... Uh, a, when, uh, a breadth of knowledge from the actual world they live in. When when books became commercially available because of automation, so being able to do the printing press, there was a huge moral panic about it, being like, youth of today, they're just going to be reading all the time. And they're not gonna, <laughs> uh, genuinely, it's, uh, genuinely, it's genuinely. It's funny when you say and, it. And, and youths are not going to be in, engaging with the world, they're just going to be in fantasy land and it's not real. Um, and yet all the amazing things that the written text has, has brought humanity. Really You're brought, told all the time now, read yeah. seven books a week. Yeah, well, but back in the day. Seven a week. <laughs> yeah. Who says that? <laughs> You're told all the time yeah. now, like, read a book a week. <laughs> Even a book a week is quite a lot. <laughs> but then You're this told goes all back. the time now to just read loads. <laughs> and this goes back even further. So I think it was Socrates was really upset about people writing things down. Um, because back in, in at those times, it was how much you could memorise that was, was really important that made you an intellectual. So the fact that you could write things down was considered cheating. cheating. And he said it was going to destroy our brains. We're going to waste away our brains because people aren't remembering stuff and youth of today aren't remembering things. So, yeah, we have this moral panic all the time, all the way through history. Um, that being said, I mean, yeah, the, the ethical considerations are really important about what these things get used for. Things can be used for good or, or ill. Um, so how do we actually know that the depths of Google yeah. aren't actually developing loads of fucking weird, creepy shit? How, is anyone out there actually holding them to account? I see clips on <laughs> on Instagram or Facebook or any social media where they're interviewing people from CEO from Google mm -hmm. or such and such and asking questions and they mock it up as if to be like, you're asking a really stupid question. But is anyone actually holding them to account? Yeah, so I started out as a scientist and this is a big problem in science as well about who's doing research and is it open for everyone to see? So it could be that some pharmaceutical company does research on some drug and they find out something really important and then they never tell anyone. And that's really bad in, in science research. So in science in general, we're trying to be open and trying to show everyone what's going on, where all things are going. Um, and that's the same with, with AI. So if companies are in charge of it, we don't know what they're doing. They're not being held accountable. So researchers being in charge of this kind of thing is quite good. So the place I work has a lot of different types of researchers working on AI problems. And the nice thing is that we're not um, bound by by different subjects. So I work with people who've come from computer science backgrounds, from biology backgrounds, from psychology backgrounds, all working on this kind of problem. And it kind of brings back that more um, general point of view. So lots of people are looking at this problem and lots of people are thinking about it in a more open way. So yeah, the Turing Institute really feels strongly about this kind of thing, about making sure that AI is open and available for other people to, to scrutinize and check that it's all above, above water. But we don't know. We don't know what Google are doing um, with their research a lot of the time. They, they tell us some things, but who knows? How does that make you feel, Joe? Nah, it makes me want to delete my Gmail account. <laughs> but then... I was told to go on Gmail. I used to have a Hotmail account mm. and it got hacked. It somehow, someone messaged my uh, financial advisor who helps me with my savings and stuff like that, messaged him saying, oh, I need to withdraw X amount of money yep. ASAP. And he was like, right. And they're back and forth with these emails. I've got no record of it on my, when I go to access that email account. It wasn't until last minute he rings me up and he goes, all right, mate, um, so you want this money sent over? And I was like, what money? And he went, oh, I've been emailing you the last couple of days. I said, oh, no, you haven't. He was like, check your... And it, the sent box, nothing was in there. There was no yeah. in the deleted or whatever. It was nowhere to be seen, but he had it all. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck? And he said, oh, you've got Hotmail. You should join Gmail. That's much more secure. You've now just 
freaks the <laughs> fuck out of me. <laughs> well, and where, where, where's, where do I go? Just go back I mean, to pigeons. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what. Go, go, it doesn't matter what email post? really you use because a lot of these these faults come in from passwords being leaked, um, people having not secure passwords, sharing passwords. So yeah, people criminals can can get into systems unfortunately across the board. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe one of them is better than others, but I don't know. Um, what is the Turing? The Turing Institute is, so we're in the British Library and we're a collection of people who've come from all sorts of different science backgrounds, research backgrounds, uh, startup companies, computer scientists, all sorts. And we all work on problems that use AI uh, for good. So we try to do research in the real world that's helpful to people, that's um, going out there and, and helping solve problems. So one of the things we work on, for example, there's an underground farm in uh, uh, near Clapham, I think. What, like what? in The, like in the Gentleman? A- <laughs> Have you seen the gentleman? I haven't seen it. They've got like loads of underground um, weed farms so up and down the country. Do you have to go in uh, to that farm through a uh, hidden tool shed in a <laughs> container? So it's in an old air raid shelter. So oh. it's um, right underground and it's um, completely got sensors all over it, which are constantly monitoring all of the... Um, the, the humidity, the water content, everything. Everything's controlled remotely so it means we can grow things really efficiently so it's uh, you can have a harvest every 10 days in this place every so. 10 days <laughs> because it's been fully optimized this is great and they have a digital twin no no, no. think of it differently rather than we immediately yeah, jump to it right. being negatively think of it like no this is fucking great this because could it, help change the world yeah because the the carbon footprint of this can be completely zero because you can fund yeah. you can power it with just uh, renewable energy and then to transport that food to cities it's just go above ground so it's a zero carbon option for food production that doesn't mean you have to use huge swathes of land huge amounts of pesticides so no pesticides are used in this in this underground farm, for example. So there's a there's a digital version of this farm, which is like a simulation version of it. And then that, from that, you can do experiments. You can see what happens when there's a really hot day. What what should we change to make sure that it functions correctly? So these kind of digital twins are really helpful for looking at complicated problems. So they get used for things like pollution in London and similar as well. So yeah, by by having these. Um, really advanced sensors we can we can control uh, the conditions of this farm to make it super super efficient and that's really useful for the growing needs of the population our soils and, and farms are, are really damaged now it's like an environmental problem and so we're we're struggling to grow food for the population and so solutions like this are really really fascinating so people at the Turing Institute are involved with that as well as people at University of Cambridge um, so yeah we work on cool problems like that and it brings together lots of different researchers and uh yeah, it's, it's it's a fascinating place to work. So aside from that, mm. what uh, are there any big AI developments? What's the next big AI development to look out for whilst <laughs> we're still alive? Because we're not going to get the general. <laughs> we're not going to get general. I don't know. Generalization we'll get generalized of AI, one. But. Yeah. Um, I think we'll see more and more um, computers being used to speed up the way that you work or help you out. So I think the kind of autocomplete that you've started seeing in your email, for example, that's being really helpful for the programmers. So I've got one, for example, that helps me write code because it goes, oh, people who write what you've just written in code tend to write the next line like this. So you start to see basically the machine helping you out and giving you shortcuts. And I think that's becoming more and more common. So it's not so much they're being replaced. It's more like boring parts of your job get sped up for you and so more I think efficient we'll see, yeah, to allow more efficient, you to do the more interesting things even more work even well more work. that there is that is <laughs> important to talk about that you need to make sure that if something is making it more efficient for yeah. you that you have got more time yeah that you then don't just fill it with yeah either procrastinating or you do it to be more efficient in other areas of your work yeah. or you use it to actually have more time at home to make you lead exactly. a happier life. I think it's a big question that's definitely going to come up is should we really be working so much as we are when things are becoming more and more productive? So if you can get a computer to help halve the amount of work you're doing, should you still be working the number of hours that you're working or should you be spending more time at home and, and all of that? And I, I think this is a really important question that will come up in the future. Um, what is important to us as human beings? Should we really be working nine to five or is that kind of a an old-fashioned thing. Lydia, have you got anything else that you would like to talk about? So I guess there is a kind of knee-jerk reaction of everything is terrifying and scary. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's an easy route to go down. But I think we can see the good that, that technology does in the world. Um, 
And well, it's why we, we have should. to, don't we? Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point in developing it? Exactly. It's it's not it's good. These developments are good. Yeah. Look at the medicine developments you get. The the underground farms that you're talking about. That, yeah. There's, for example, the idea that computers can learn from images could be super scary because you could think, oh my goodness, what could that be used for? But at the same time, it could be used for. Um, so it's already being used for looking at brain scans. So you can find out that people have got dementia years earlier now because computers are better at finding the patterns that a human being would struggle to find. So so even though there are bad uses for AI and, and maybe some of these tech companies, you know, maybe we're a bit nervous about what they're up to. There's so many incredibly exciting things that are being used with AI that are going to change the world and make things better for health and for science research and everything. So, yeah, as much as some of this is scary, I think it's the same as anything. Tools can be used for, for bad things, but also very exciting things. So it, what's important is that we continue talking about it and thinking about it and making sure that there's lots of discussion about what should should be allowed to be out there and what maybe should be regulated. Before coming on um, to the show, mm. I was so excited. I was like, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to this one. And then meeting you, having you talk the way you've spoken to us, I've loved everything. Every second of it. And it's, in fact, exceeded my expectations of how this was going to go. So I just want to say a massive thank you for coming in. and You're welcome. And telling us all about AI. And it's not and, all scary. And not and scaring us a little bit, but actually making us realise these developments on the whole are, are for good. Yeah. So it's just how we look at it and approach it. So thank you. Definitely. Thank you for having me.